pleasure, the very extreme pleasure of introducing our next storyteller, Leonia Keller Kurgan, who is a psychoanalyst and a psychodramatist and a storyteller. She tells family stories, myths, fairy tales, and sacred stories. She seeks to tell the truth in an interesting way. Please welcome Leonia. My story is called Cleopatra. <laughs> My parents had a party to commemorate their 25th wedding anniversary. My mother was 48 and I was 17. Our house that is usually very sparsely furnished looked quite, quite uh, exotic with red and blue lights. The food was delicious. Our favorite roast duck and red cabbage, a wonderful Polish dessert called malakoff, and my father made some red homemade wine. I saw my mother dancing with Mr. T. He was a tall, good-looking man, and they were dancing cheek to cheek in that horrible way my parents' generation did. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I vaguely knew Mr. T, but I knew his wife, Mrs. T, better. She would visit me with my mother in the living room. I would hear them gossiping. And sometimes Mrs. T would say, her husband, he pays no attention to me. My mother was wearing a strapless turquoise dress with a ribbon woven into the bodice. And the ribbon looked as if the bodice, it held up the bodice, otherwise it would fall off. <laughs> and she was dancing with Mr. T. Suddenly, she pulled away from him and she said, you always do that. You always end up biting me. <laughs> I was shocked at her shrill cry. I mean, really. It was so undignified. <laughs> In the weekends, my parents always went dancing. Every, every weekend. The, um, the next morning, my father would come downstairs and he would tell my sister and me, your mother, she was the belle of the ball. All the men wanted to dance with her. Or he would say, your mother, she stood on the table and danced. And, and everybody watched her. <laughs> but I never saw her do that. I was surprised that my father seemed so proud and enjoyed the fact that other men found my mother attractive. They often talk about dancing during dinner, and my mother would say to my father, don't ask Vanda to dance. She doesn't like you. Ask Nina, she likes you. <laughs> well, after my mother screamed so loudly, I looked to see if my father was watching her. But he wasn't. He was dancing with Nina, just as my mother had suggested. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed to me that I was the only one who noticed my mother's shrill cry. That evening, I wore a red sleeveless red uh, knit, uh, sweater that I had knitted myself. And it woven into the wool was a uh, uh, silver strand. And I paired the sweater with a navy blue uh, taffeta skirt. Mr. S, one of my parents' friends, asked me to dance. And he said to me, you look so pretty tonight. And I was very really pleased he said that. And then he went on and he said, you know, you must think we're such old fergies with our old-fashioned way of dancing, not like the modern way you kids dance. I said, no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't go dancing often. And I thought to myself, Mr. S, how little you know me. <laughs> I didn't feel very good about myself. I often feel lonely. I'm not part of the, the best crowd. Uh, so, anyhow, he did think that I was a party girl. <laughs> the previous year at high school, I had learnt a play uh, we studied Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. And I'll never, it was a wonderful play, and I'll never forget the speech that Emma Barbas made about Cleopatra as she rode in the barge down the River Nile 
to meet her Antony. And Anababa said, Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Other women cloy the appetite they feed on, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies. And then Anabarbus went on and he said, even the winds were lovesick for Cleopatra. <laughs> and I, like Anabarbus and Mark Antony and the winds, admired this Cleopatra woman. At that, and, and not only that, what was even more strange was that Cleopatra was not a young woman. She was an older woman, and I had always thought at that time that sex and romance really was a prerogative of the young. But my mother, she was different. In some ways, I saw her as Cleopatra. Although, in family gatherings, uh, when there was no litter of parties and there were no other men present, she was very quiet, kind of into her own self, and she didn't say much. She didn't say much to add to the conversation. Uh, but since I was a little girl, I sensed an icky quality about my mother <laughs> that I couldn't understand. <laughs> she was not like other mothers who doted on their children. The way she looked at men, her vivacious smile, her laughing, come hither eyes. Then as I got to my teens, I changed my mind. And I played with the idea, perhaps I could do. Perhaps I too could be a woman that I was beginning to see my mother was. I too had desire for men, but deep down, I hated my mother's sensuality, her close so-called friendships with so many men other than my father, and her neglect of my sister and me. Not realizing that I hated her sensuality so much, I lived my life as if I wasn't sensual. That is, I threw away the baby with the bathwater. I told myself to focus on book knowledge, to focus on what makes people tick to focus on what makes my mother tick. I became a psychoanalyst. <laughs> it took me a long time to understand what happened that night and how it affected who I later became. I married, I had three children. I tried my best to love my children unconditionally, but I was far from the good enough mother I'd hoped to be. And until I was 40, I never allowed myself to even look at a man other than my, my husband. Eventually, I realized I had made a mistake as a young girl. I did not have to live the opposite of my mother's life just because I was critical of it. I separated from my mother's sensuality. I developed more compassion for her, but not entirely. I proceeded to find out what my own sensuality meant to me, and it took me a very long time. It is a much older woman who now stands before you. But if all goes well, I believe that the life force which includes sexuality stays with us till death do us part. Thank you.